You're listening to the free feed of occult symbolism and pop culture, which means you're missing out. Help the show out. Get rewarded with bonuses. Join any of my three supporter feeds. You'll get the ad-free experience, early access, and unlock hundreds of bonus episodes the free feed losers don't get to hear. You can also score free books, discounted merch, and more. The most popular option is patreon.com slash Illuminati Watcher. The easiest one is Apple Premium, where you sign up on the app. The cheapest one is my own, IlluminatiWatcher.com VIP section. Compare the three platforms at IlluminatiWatcher.com. Hit the VIP tab up top. Links are always in the show notes. Ooh, yeah! Hey, you know what I love? CrossFit. You know what else I love? Not wearing t-shirts because I'm white trash. You know what else I love? That's not compatible with those things? Eating. That's right. So unfortunately, that means I got to eat appropriately. And 2024 is my year to get right. So join me. Get started on your resolutions with Factor. And you're going to be ready to start your new year. Factor is ready to eat. Meal delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success. You're going to skip the grocery stores. Skip that mint brownie that's always calling your name at the little snack area when you walk into the store. You're going to no more prep work, no more cooking fatigue. Instead, you get these chef crafted dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door with over 35 meals to choose from per week. You ever have queso fundido or garlic mushroom chicken thighs? They're already made. You just get to eat them. How great is that? They've got options like keto, calorie smart, vegan, veggie, and more, plus over 55 weekly add ons. You're going to have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. And look, they got a, a ton of talking points here. I can I can read to you, but here's the truth. I love Factor because this is a time saver because I'm I'm cooking. And when I cook, it's a total nightmare between making sure you got the ingredients, going to the grocery store, prepping, cooking, then cleaning. And you're not even done yet. You still got to load the dishwasher, which means you're going to have to unload that dishwasher. It gets exhausting. It really does. And when you're you're living your life, you're working, you're, I don't know, running the kids to sports ball practice, your brain, it it will start, it'll seductively whisper in your ear. It'll be like, hey, buddy, why don't you just go buy the pizza? <laughs> or, uh, you know, go do dri- drive through fast food. But but look, that's you know that's not going to get you to our goals. These are our goals. The garlic mushroom chicken thighs that are already prepared and cooked, they will. And their factor is going to mail them to you. All you got to do is put them in the fridge and then you throw them in the oven. And I've always said, you know, if I was if I was rich, if I was Joe Rogan, the first frivolous expense, it's not going to be a, a fancy vacation home. It's not going to be a Lamborghini. It's a personal chef. And that's basically what Factor is. Isn't that amazing? So head to factormeals.com slash OSPC50. And then you got to use that code OSPC50 like occult symbolism, pop culture, right? You get it? And you use that code, and you're going to get 50% off. Use code OSPC50 at factormeals.com slash OSPC50 to get 50% off. Link in the show notes as always. Welcome back to Occult Symbolism and Pop Culture. I am your host, Isaac Wiseup. Today we're going to talk about the Book of Enoch. What are the Nephilim? Who are the Watchers? And what are the interpretations of this mystical book from the Dead Sea Scrolls? Today we're going to talk about it. And this comes on the uh, the hills of that Miami Mall incident with the Nephilim. But today we're finally talking about it. Finally. I've been talking about doing this show for at least a year because I had all these notes. And I had, uh, you know, because this is actually a really big topic. I planned on making it a two-parter, but I don't know. I think, I think it was just make it one big part. Okay? Does that sound good? That sounds great. We're, we're going to talk about the Watchers, the Nephilim, the forbidden arts of the occult. This is arguably where it all came from, where all this ritual magic and stuff, this is where it came from. This is the source. Evil. We're gonna re- I'm going to read you straight from the Book of Enoch. We'll discuss various interpretations from uh, Orthodoxy and Damien Eccles and LDS Church. Um, Azazel, the fallen angel himself. We'll look at an idea that Enoch is actually Hermes Trismegistus, the the uh, Thoth, right? The Egyptian god Thoth, who gave us the laws of alchemy and the Emerald Tablets. 
And then we're going to wrap up with a fun little ditty into the idea that, hey, wait a minute, are we experiencing the end times? Is this the apocalypse? (laughs) Find out today. We're going to find out today. Uh, But yeah, this Miami Nephilim, the Miami Mall aliens thing really put a spotlight on this subject just, you know, a couple weeks ago here. So I thought, man... I've been talking about working on this Book of Enoch episode for so long. Let me put some finishing touches on it and just wrap it up, okay? And uh, that's what that's what we're doing because it's an important subject. And I thought, man, why why sit on this and try to perfect it to make it this big ordeal? Let's just let's just go through the basics of it. We'll go a little deep, whatever. I was working on it diligently, had tons of notes on this stuff, so I just had to polish it together, finish up a couple uh, research points, and. It's going to be a great primer to clarify a lot of these ideas about what's going on in the realm of conspiracy, UFOs, aliens, and all that stuff. By all means, you can go as hard as you want, you know? We're going to start off... Well, first, I'm going to, I'm going to prep the listener to understand what the Book of Enoch and its structure is, and then we're going to read right from the Book of Enoch, and then we're going to go into the interpretations and expand into theories and... All that and talk about how the world's ending and get ready and all these great things. So the Book of Enoch from so there was a guy, Dr. Michael Heiser, who was one of the early researchers that I would listen to a lot of what he was saying back in the 2010s, early 2010s. He I, I'm going to butcher this. I should have, again, a couple polished, a couple notes that need polished. <laughs> Dr. Michael Heiser. Uh, he, he was a biblical scholar on some level. I don't know his exact credentials, but he's an expert on it, right? And he, what was interesting about him, he just passed away last year. What's interesting is that he sort of started, you know, his ideas would splash on the fringe of conspiracy talk, and that's how I found him, because he didn't shy away from some of these topics like the Watchers and the Enoch and all that stuff. So he's a book. He's got a couple books, and I bought both of them. And th- that that was one of the delays was I planned on reading both of these cover to cover before I did this show, but I did not have time. So I, uh, you know, speed read, try to get the, the basics of what he was talking about. But Enoch, he so he has, a, he has one called, oh, boy. You know, Isaac, this is what happens. When you try to rush something, things like this happen. Okay, Dr. Michael Heiser, A Companion, Book of Enoch, A Reader's Commentary, Volume 1. And then his other book is called Reversing Herman, Herman, Enoch, The Watchers, and the Forgotten Mission of Jesus Christ. I didn't read that one at all, okay? So I had a listener tell me I had to check out those books, so I bought them. And, you know, true to form, I've got a growing library, and uh, it grows faster than I can read them. So, Okay. He says there's three books of Enoch. The first book, Enoch 1, is actually a composite of different parts written in different time periods. And he breaks down the verse, the verses, right? Like verses 1 through 36 is all about the watchers, these fallen angels. And that section was written 3rd century BC or even earlier, he thinks, right? Before Christ. Then uh, he says that the first Enoch book expands upon Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, talking about the history of the Great Flood. It talks about the Watchers, obviously, and that's considered apocalyptic literature about the end of days because that's what Noah witnessed was the end of days, an apocalypse, a revealing of God's wrath when he wiped out the whole planet except for Noah and his ark. But verses 1 through 36 is all about the Watchers and their depravity. Then 37 through 71 is some parables about Enoch's vision during his journey into heaven because he was taken to heaven by God. That's what the Bible says. Then 72 through 82 is just some astronomical observations. Then 83 through 90 is Enoch recounting a couple of these dream visions to Methuselah a vision of the flood and human history all the way back to Adam, all the way to the end of the days. He does it through metaphor, referring to people as animals, which is ironically the Church of Satan doctrine to call man just an animal. But, you know, this is old-timey. They were 
they would tell parables, right? They would they would use metaphor to tell stories. Then ninety three, and this is where you know sections of ninety three and ninety one. Another vision of the apocalypse, the history of the world, the future end days. They call it, you know, eschatology is the term they use. Uh, it says, quote, when the purposes of the God of Israel will ultimately be realized. And then uh, there's in, in between that stuff, there's a state of human wickedness and how the apocalypse vision will happen and a warning about the end days and how we need to walk in the path of justice of all things good. Then you've got the second book of Enoch, which he refers to as an amplification of Genesis 5, 21 through 32. It covers the life of Enoch and what, you know, brought on the flood. And the uh, <laughs> and the third book of Enoch is apparently a sort of Gnostic spin on things. And like I said, there's, from what I understand, there's multiple authors and multiple versions and uh, different books that were kind of amalgamized together but there's three books or three chapters as they would say and the first one was written before christ the second and third one were written after christ you know and then there were some texts written that uh by the jews where um that was sort of lumped into it it's not a simple straightforward like oh there was this guy named enoch and he wrote all this stuff down it's not quite as simple as that that's that's my takeaway from it all right now, who was Enoch? Let's talk about that. Let's go to Wikipedia for the sort of, uh, you know, they, they do a good job of summing up. Are they always entirely accurate? Not always. Sometimes they like to, I've noticed in my research, sometimes they'll omit certain things that are a little controversial or whatever, right? So obviously take it with a grain of salt. Enoch was great-grandfather to Noah, and he went on a journey with God himself. He explains the origin story of the Watchers and the reason for God's righteous judgment and the other realms like heaven and hell. The Book of Enoch is apocalyptical literature, also refer referenced as an apocryphal work, meaning it is not part of the formal biblical canon. But like that doesn't that doesn't mean it doesn't hold value because there's actually lots of apocrypha books referenced in the actual Bible. Uh, some call it the intertestamental, intertestamental minnow. Oh boy, I can't even say it. Intertestamental, <laughs> as opposed to the Old Testament or the New Testament. All right, apocrypha simply means hidden, like the word occult. By the way, means hidden. But the reason this topic is so hot right now is because it gives about as much clarity on the topic of Nephilim and the fallen angels, the watchers, as you could ask for, right? And these books of Enoch were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls at the, the Qumran Caves in the West Bank on the Dead Sea Shores in 1947, or a series of years, from the 47 all the way through the 50s. Now... That's also very strange to me, right? Because obviously West Bank is in the news for... A, there's always a battle over the territory. And 1947, what an interesting year that was, you know? That's when we when we had the Roswell contact. That's around the time Jack Parsons was doing the Babylon working with... You know what? The Enochian language. And we're going to explain all that as we go through. And now I'm going to go through all the Book of Enoch. And then we're going to... I'm going to put it into reference as to some of the topics we've covered over the years here on this show and in my two alien books which by the way chris shout out chris just bought the i got a i got a two book package on my gumroad store you get signed copies of use your illusion one and use your illusion two man what a deal <laughs> but um side note the nag hammadi gnostic text were found in egypt in 1945 and this included the Corpus Hermetica. These are texts by Hermes or Thoth, which some claim is actually Enoch, right? What, I'm, what I think is going on here is it, I'm just pointing out the strangeness of all this alien contact using the Enochian language around the time of all the discoveries of all this Enochian texts. I mean, what are the odds? What are the odds? We're talking thousands of years. 
I mean, I don't even know, besides, you know, trying to, you know, without ridiculing the audience, like, think about that. Think about the odds that these texts by Enoch were found around the time we had that Roswell crash, which arguably was done through the Jack Parsons and Nokian language rituals. I mean, it blows the mind. It's wild. Now, in the book of Enoch, there's the term Nephilim. Um, I'm sorry. Rewind that. The book of Enoch only refers to the watchers, not the Nephilim, right? The uh, the book of Enoch just talks about the watchers and the sons that they create. Now, these sons are the Nephilim because the Nephilim is in the book, uh, the book of Genesis. That's where you find that. And it's translated as giants or the fallen ones. But they are the offspring of the watchers who are the fallen angels that came to earth, procreated with the women, made a little sexy time forbidden sexy time you thought salt burn was bad lord knows what was going on back then but some say that the nephilim are descendants of cain and his brother seth after cain slew abel again massive topics that you know you could go back and forth on what's real what's not who believes what i'm sure different scholars have different opinions And one of the ideas is that before the flood, we had two paths of light or dark, good or evil. Seth was seeking God. That was the path of light. Then you had Cain, who was self-centered and rejecting God. And this is, again, a metaphor for the left hand and the right hand path. The right hand path is connection to God. Left hand path is separation from God to become your own God. It's all spiritual. Now, let's get into the book of Enoch itself. This is the, uh, I'm going to read you from the first book of Enoch translated from Ethiopic by Reverend George Shod, PhD professor at Capital University, Columbus, Ohio. That's the copy I've got. And, you know, chapters, uh, they, they break it up into three sections. And this section is actually all about the watchers. And the chapters, like we talked about earlier, the chapters after this go into Enoch's visions. You know, you could go into that too, but we're not going to get into the visions today. That's not a thing. Uh, that Not a thing. That's not a thing that is, I don't think, super relevant to the topic of aliens and Nephilim. It could be more into the realm of the end days, which we will talk about later. So, I mean, you, again, this show could be much longer. But we're into alien giants right now. That's what's trending on the news. And by God, that's what you're going to hear. That's what we're promoting. That's what we're plugging. How do you think I get you to tune in? I got to find the sensational thing. You know, it makes me wonder about the... I've had a... I did a show. I do a show called Breaking Social Norms with my wife, Josie. And uh, I'm, I'm, I think I might drop it on this feed I think a lot of people didn't love it because I, when I first did the show with her, I dropped it on this on the uh, occult symbolism feed, and uh, my, it was my fault. Josie was very new to it, and I I think she was nervous and she was using uh, she you know we cuss at home right we're we're big we're big swearers at home, and uh, she was swearing and a lot of people couldn't handle that you know they don't want to hear a woman swear or they don't like swearing at all and that's fine whatever. Uh, so this one's going to have less swearing because as she got comfortable under her sort of podcasting voice, she's got better. But um, I'm thinking about dropping it on here because it's a topic that's very important. It's about not going black pill. And we have to question the conspiracy movement because I think what has happened now is the mainstream media, right? We pick on them all the time. Oh, they're always lying to us. They're always sensationalizing. They're always fear mongering. And why do they do that? They do it for views. They do it to get you to tune in. You know, they they know that there's a news cycle that they got to fill. They got to sell sensationalism and get you interested. So they got to make you mad to, to get you to tune in. And what do the conspiracy people do? Right. I mean, myself included. We watch the news and we're like, oh, that's the sensational thing. Let's talk about it. Let's get people fired up. Well, then who's the mainstream media? Really? Are we are we just supporting? We're just two wings on the same bird at this point. Just talking about the same things from different angles of 
of how there's this big conspiracy to change things and it's so terrible i I don't know it's hard because i think uh, ultimately the division of things is what keeps us from making any progress and it destroys your personal life and that's why i i uh, i think 2024 is going to be a year where i want m- my audience to find a way to not go black pill i don't know how that's going to shape up or how that's going to look but it was an interesting conversation we had um, I might drop it on this feed. I might not. I don't know. If you want to listen to it, it's over at BreakingSocialNorms.com. It's the Black Pill episode. Go subscribe. Check it out. Uh, it, I got a lot of great feedback on it. A lot of people, were, they thought we were bringing up some really interesting ideas and thoughts. Um, I don't know. It's really in the back of my mind now. Why are we talking about it? I don't remember. <laughs> what are we doing? Section one of the Book of Enoch. Uh, it's real heavy on talk about judgment and eternal damnation and, you know, you better be in good favor with God so you can go to heaven, right? You know the drill. Section two. This is where, it start, this is the interesting part. This is the meat of it. It explains who the watchers were. It says there was 200 of them and they were cursed. They took a pact, a, a blood pact, I would argue, like the Faustian bargain. Like all these ideas of celebrities selling their soul. I mean, isn't that interesting? This was written hundreds of years before Christ, thousands of years ago. They were talking about this. And we're still talking about it today. Roseanne, just I just did a whole show on Roseanne. Selling your soul to the devil. And, I mean, she's not the only one. Tons of them do it. And this isn't ironic because on that same show I talked about how Tucker was talking about the Nephilim with Roseanne. Anyway. I talk about how the, this book talks about how they took a pact, a curse, and they came down from Mount Hermon to take some wives. Hide your wife, hide your kids. Chapter 6, verse 3, it says, I fear that perhaps ye will not be willing to do this deed, and I alone shall suffer for this great sin. Then all answered him and said, We all will swear an oath and bind ourselves mutually by a curse, that we will not give up this plan, but will make this plan a deed. Then they were all swore together and bound themselves mutually by a curse, and together they were 200. And then in this next section I'm going to read to you, it, the Watchers, they they take the curse, they go to Earth, can't resist the women. I mean, who can blame them? God really did a good job there. <laughs> the, the Watchers, they come to, they're like, they're like look, I'm, I'm selling everything. I need to get these human women. And we're going down there and we're doing this thing. So they go down there, they make sexy time, they make babies, they teach them occult magic, the, they, teach, they, they start doing cannibalism, it's wild. Let me read you from chapter 7. And they took unto themselves wives, and each chose for himself one, and they began to go into them, and mixed with them, and taught them charms and conjurations, and made them acquainted with the cutting of roots and of woods, and they became pregnant. And brought forth great giants whose stature was 3,000 L's. I don't know how many, how many, what's 3,000 L's? Let's see, uh, distance of an L. 45 inches. It says in England, the L was 45 inches. So they're saying 3,000, let's put this into perspective, folks. 3,000 L's is 135,000 inches. Divided by 12 inches. It's 11,000 feet. That's terrifying. Okay. That's terrifying. 11,000 feet. I mean, how tall is a skyscraper? How tall is Empire? So, see, this is the reason uh, it's only 1,200 feet. 10 times taller than the... the um, 10 times taller than the... Than the Empire State Building. Are you scared yet? I'm a little scared. That's a terrifyingly tall. I mean, when that at that point they're up in the atmosphere, there's not enough room for all these giants. I don't know if that makes sense. Maybe that's not right. That might not be accurate. That's really tall. So, anyways, there were three thousand L's, whatever that meant. These devoured all the acquisitions of mankind till men were unable to sustain themselves, and the giants turned themselves against mankind in order to devour them. And they began to sin against the birds and the beasts and against the creeping things and the fish and devoured their flesh among themselves and drank the blood thereof. 
Then the earth complained of the unjust ones. So they're teaching cannibalism. Again, a topic we keep seeing conspiracies about by the elites, the secret societies. I think we're coming back to that in a minute. Let's get through the book first. Then the watchers, they teach mankind how to be vain. Oh, boy. They're teaching them how to be influencers. Chapter 8 says, And Azazel taught mankind to make swords and knives and shields and coats of mail and taught them to see what was behind them and their works of art. Bracelets and ornaments. The use of rouge and the beautifying of the eyebrows and the dearest choicest stones and all coloring substances and the metals of earth. And there was great wickedness, much fornification, and they sinned, and all their ways were corrupt. Amazarak taught all the conjurers and root cutters, Amaros, the loosening of conjurations, Barakal, the astrologers, Kokabel, the signs, and Temel taught astrology, Azradel taught the course of the moon, and in the, the destruction of mankind, they cried aloud and their voices reached heaven. So you can see they each have names. Which, by the way, I'm reading. Uh, I'm trying to read this book. Josie's really into these these horny novels, fantasy novels. Um, a court of Ro- a court of thorns and roses, or something. And they all use all those fantasy books. They all use weird names like this. Arguably the same names. I know there's. I know there's a fantasy book with a a winged fairy named Azazel. I already know it's out there. I don't know which one it would be, but it's got to be out there. Because, again, all these fantasy books, they talk about occult stuff of magic and doing all, you know, whatever, right? And uh, this is the, oh, my gosh, this is the first, uh, you know, horny supernatural book. My goodness, we just discovered this. Isn't that something? Wow. Man, big, um, big revelations (laughs) coming around today. Oh, boy. Um, Okay, so Michael and Gabriel... It, are watching they're watching all this madness right and there's there's war there's blood spilling there's wickedness they call out azazel they're like oh you you know these angels michael and gabriel they're like you taught all these forbidden arts and look at all the havoc it's wreaking on god's creation they're putting things in places that are not supposed to have things put my goodness I'm going to read you. It says, see what then, see then what Azazel has done, how he has taught all wickedness on earth and has revealed the secrets of the world, which were prepared in the heavens. And Samjaza, who t- whom t- thou hast given the power to be chief of his associates, has made known conjurations. And they've gone together to the daughters of men and have slept with them. And with those women have defiled themselves and have revealed to them these sins. And the women have brought forth giants, and thereby the whole earth has been filled with blood and wickedness. So at this point, they decide they're going to punish everyone on earth with the flood. And they're going to send these watchers into darkness through an opening in the desert. Hell. Says they're going to cast them into the fires. Which, you know, is interesting because Charles Manson talked about that too. In, uh, where was he? Uh, Barker Ranch. Opening up, opening up, uh, uh, what a gateway to hell or whatever in the apocalyptic end times. But there was a curious statement made, which I read, and in my very amateur interpretation, it seems to say that the occult teachings will somehow go on. This is how I read it, okay? Let's, let me read you from it. And on the great day of judgment, he will be cast into the fire and heal the earth, which the angels have defiled, and announce the healing of the earth, that I will heal it. And not, and that not all the sons of men shall be destroyed through the mystery of all the things which the watchers have spoken and taught their sons. Remember, the sons of men are the Nephilim. And he says right there, not all the sons of men shall be destroyed. So arguably, the idea is that there's a, the earth reached a saturation of too much evil and then there was just a little tiny left over, and he knew it was going to grow, and that's going to be the final judgment, the end times. 
So when we get to the point where the whole earth is filled with blood and wickedness and cannibalism and conjuring and astrology and uh, fornification and sinning and corrupting and rouge, the rouge bracelets. <laughs> this is why, you know, I grew up in a church where, uh, you know, guys weren't allowed to have earrings and stuff like this. And tat- tattoos were definitely forbidden. And maybe that's where this comes from, honestly, which obviously it's bad news for me. But uh, maybe this is where a lot of this stuff comes from. Maybe it's just an, a tale as old as time. Then the next section, Enoch makes a proclamation to the leader of the Watchers, Azazel, that they're going to be condemned. They ask Enoch to put in a good word to God because they're not able to communicate with him anymore. And Enoch does because he's a good guy, apparently. Uh, Chapter 14, it says, "And And I had had so long a veil upon my face, and I trembled. And the Lord called me with his own voice and said to me, Come hither, Enoch, and to my holy word. And he caused me to arise, and I went to the door. But I bent my face back downwards. And he answered and spoke to me with his word. Hear and fear not, Enoch, thou just man and thou just man and scribe of justice, approach hither and hear my words. And go say to the watchers of heaven who have sent thee that you shouldest petition for them. Ye should petition for men and not men for you. Why have ye left the high we're going somewhere with this folks, okay? I know. I'm getting I'm already falling asleep. We're getting there. Hang on. Why have ye left the high, holy, and everlasting heaven and lain with women and defiled yourselves with the daughters of men and taken wives unto yourselves and acted like the children of earth and begotten giants of, as sons? Here we go. Listen. While ye were spiritual, holy, having eternal life, ye defiled yourselves with women and with the blood of flesh have begotten children. And have lusted after the blood of men, and have produced flesh and blood as they produce who die and are destroyed. So, the point of that, lusted after the blood of men. Are we talking about the cannibalism still? Seems like it, right? Like they had real beef with uh, the cannibalism thing, you know? Okay, let's keep going. Therefore, I have given them wives that they may impregnate them and children be born by them as it is done on earth. Ye were formerly spiritual, living an eternal life without death to all generations of the world. Therefore, I have not made for you any wives for spiritual beings have their home in heaven. All right, here's the part you got to listen to. And now the giants who have been begotten from body and flesh will be called evil spirits on earth and their dwelling places will be upon the earth. Evil spirits proceed from their bodies because they are created from above. Their beginning and the first basis being from the holy watchers. They will be evil spirits upon the earth and will be called evil spirits. And then it goes on and on and on. Uh, I'm gonna I'm just gonna cut right to the next part that you gotta listen to. Ye have been in heaven, and though the secrets were not re- yet revealed to you, still ye knew illegitimate mysteries. And these ye have in the hardness of your hearts related to the women. And through these mysteries, women and men increase wickedness over the earth. Tell them, therefore, ye have no peace. Listen up. We've seen so many people making ridiculous money from crypto. But did you know it's easy for you to do the same? If you followed my show, you know that we've talked about the cryptocurrencies going all the way back to 2017. Very fascinating subject. But there's a way you can get into all this with the easiest way possible. It's the Copy My Crypto membership site that shows you the coins that YouTuber James McMahon personally holds and allows you to copy him. It's like having a big brother who knows what he's doing. You don't need to know a thing about crypto or how to invest as you simply do what he does. I'm also a member of this, and I've combed through some of the videos. He's got some how-to videos showing you where to get the coins, how to make it happen. It's all there for you. So let me tell you about James. He runs the Crypto with James YouTube channel, which despite heavy censorship, we all know YouTube loves the censorship. It's hit 26,000 subscribers, which is a big to do, right? Since March 2020, he told his viewers to buy 26 crypto coins. And had you put 100 bucks into each one, it went on to become worth more than $123,000. So of the 26 coins, his top pick of the year, a coin called Phantom, 
went up 692x from when he said. That one call has retired a number of people, including guys in their 20s and 30s. But remember, this is all public knowledge. You can go to YouTube and verify this for yourself. So if you'd like to join the 2,800 members and your boy Isaac, who copied James, then stop what you're doing. Head over to copymycrypto.com slash Isaac. That's copymycrypto.com forward slash Isaac, I-S-A-A-C, right? Two A's for double awesome. A lot of people misspell that. They throw two S's in there. No, it's two A's for double awesome. You got it. So copymycrypto.com forward slash Isaac. You'll not only find proof of everything I've said, but my listeners get full access for just one dollar. Once again, it's copymycrypto.com forward slash Isaac. Link in the show notes as always. So, and in there they're talking about illegitimate mysteries, okay? And how the illegitimate mysteries, I believe, is the forbidden arts, right? That's why they say not to do not to do the ritual magic and all these things. Not to do astrology, don't play with Ouija boards, don't talk to ghosts, don't channel aliens. That's why they tell us not to do these things, because I, I think this might be where the root of it all is. Now let's get into the interpretations, okay? Um I'm gonna we'll start out with the authoritarian source, the Orthodox Study Bible, Genesis chapter six, verse one. And it's all about man's wickedness. All right, because remember, the book of Enoch is an amplification of the book of Genesis. Now it came to pass that men began to exist in great numbers on the earth, and daughters were born to them. So when the sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful, they took wives for themselves of all they chose. And of course, you know, none of this is new, right? Let's keep going. Then the Lord God said, My spirit shall not remain with these people forever, for they are flesh. So their days shall be 120 years. Now there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men of old, men of renown. This is the Nephilim, okay? And which I think, I don't know which which Bibles use the term Nephilim, but that's what they're talking about. And remember, if you listen to my Hoover Dam series, part three, we bought this very obscure book by the architect, Oscar Hanniger. And all the statues down at Hoover Dam, guess what they were based upon? His ideas in that book. And he talks about the men of renown. He talks about the Watchers and the Nephilim. He, he I don't know. He kind of knew some things, I guess. All right. Now let's get into the interpretation. Because then, then he talks about, God talks about, you know, flooding the earth, whatever, right? Well, the interpretation from the Orthodox Study Bible says, In his disobedience and expulsion from paradise, man lost the grace of the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, his grace was always available to man, but man continually refused it. For they are flesh. So God gave them a grace period of 120 years to come to repentance. And this is what bugs me. They skip verse 4. That's the one that talks about the mighty men of old, men of renown. The Orthodox Study Bible skips verse 4. I'm like, bro, that's the most important part of the book. What are we doing? What, what are we doing here, folks? But they skip verse 4, if you can believe that. Then it says, Without the grace of the Holy Spirit, man is easily overcome by the devil, for his willpower alone is incapable of resisting the devil's temptations. Furthermore, his will is weakened through disobedience and expulsion from paradise, but he will he but he willfully refused God's helping grace. So God was grieved over man's conditions of murder and adultery, fornicate, fornifications, thefts, and every manner of sin was rampant everywhere. Human race was in danger of disappearing completely. Which that doesn't make sense to me. Like, okay, so then you kill everybody? What what are we talking about? But you know, I don't know the mind of God, right? Who am I to question? But that's what this says. It says the human race was in danger of disappearing from the face of the earth. So that leads me to think, okay, so we flood the earth and we kill everybody dang near. Maybe that's not what they're talking about. Maybe they're not talking about literally disappearing like the human species, everyone's going to die. No, no, no. Maybe they're saying mankind was going to birth a new species, which is what's happening today. There's a theory that we are birthing 
a new revolution, the transhuman. The AI is guiding us down the path of transhumanism so that the human species will be no more. So we are currently in danger of disappearing from the face of the earth. That's what I think is going on. It says, God grieved over these people he created and swore to blot them out from the face of the earth, yet he gave them a grace period of 120 years. Okay, okay, okay. But Noah was different from the rest. He discovered the grace of the Holy Spirit. Because of the discovery, God would preserve a remnant through which God, the word, would become man. So, that's why Noah was spared. Is that where we're headed again? I'm not sure. What are the Nephilim, though? I, you know, we skipped that in the Orthodox Study Bible, but good news. Father Stephen Day Young, who co-hosts the Lord of Spirits podcast with Father Damick on uh, ancientfaith.com, talked about it, says that Nephilim means giants or tyrants or bullies or wicked, which makes sense. St. Augustine believed that all of these figures were literal, literal. And he says that the Book of Enoch was talking about Babylonian traditions and the Apkulu, uh, no, Apkalu. They were six kings who reigned before the flood, and these were the gods to the Mesopotamians. That's why they ruled. They had mastered technology again. That whole idea about humans disappearing from the face of the earth. I think we're re we're, we're rebuilding the Tower of Babel with technology. And listen to this. He connects it to Gilgamesh from the Sumerian creation mythology and all that ancient alien stuff and Zechariah Sitchin because Gilgamesh talks about transhumanism, right? I'm going to read you from uh, Father Stephen de Young. It is not coincidence that these are the same advances described in the genealogy of Cain in Genesis 4, 17 through 24. The first post-flood king, likewise, has an Apkalu listed as his advisor. And then the following kings, such as the hero Gilgamesh, who are said to be two-thirds Apkalu, or the product of divine and human coupling. The Sumerian king list, which lists Gilgamesh among the kings of Uruk, identifies him as being the son of a spirit or ghost. The Book of the Giants from the Dead Sea Scrolls identifies Gilgamesh as one of the Nephilim. Genesis can therefore be seen to be interpreting what was, for its original hearers, the historical record of gods and kings through a very different lens. Uh, this perspective then of the biblical writers, also, as well as later Jewish and Christian interpreters, is that these so-called gods were in fact demonic spirits. The wisdom which they taught was actually depravity and corruption, and that these heroes were petty tyrants produced by demonic fornification so Gilgamesh is part of the Nephilim isn't that something I mean that's pretty wild right because we've heard so much about um, Gilgamesh from all the ancient alien stuff and Zachariah Sitchin's Nibiru and all this stuff and the I don't know if they I don't know if Zachariah Sitchin's angle is that Gilgamesh was a great guy though uh, they say that the Anunnaki enslaved mankind according to the, the Epic of Gilgamesh and things like that. Okay, let's move on to some other interpretations, because I'm not going to just use the Orthodox Study Bible and say, well, that's it, folks. That's the definitive word. Let's go to Damien Eccles. We'll go to uh, the occult side of the spectrum. Uh, he's an interesting guy. He definitely he definitely studies a lot of this occult stuff and Aleister Crowley and ritual magic, and uh, you know he's a very, very well-versed guy in it. Um, let's see here. So I saw this, and again, I took notes on this at least a year ago. I think I saw it on YouTube. It could have been on his Patreon that I had to watch. I had to pay to watch it. I don't remember. Either way, here's the notes from the topic, the short version, right? He said that, and I'm paraphrasing my interpretations, that the book of Enoch is the foundational book for all of ritual magic that you find in Gnosticism, Mormonism, uh, and, you know, ritual ceremonial magic. That it was found with the Nag Hammadi in, like we said, 1947 through the 50s or whatever. But Joseph Smith was actually doing this stuff found in the Book of Enoch long before this Book of Enoch was found, which is true. I think Joseph Smith was in the 1800s, right? 
He says that Enoch is actually Metatron, which was surprising to me. Remember Santana, the singer or guitarist or whatever you call him, musician. He said that he was in contact with, with Metatron or he was Metatron or something like that. Damien said that Enoch ascended through 10 levels of heaven to be with God. That sounds like the Kabbalistic tree of life with the 10 Sephirot, maybe. Maybe, I don't know. He said that Enoch completed the great work and then taught it to Noah. And Enoch said his message was for the people in the future in the time of tribulation. Now, I don't know if I agree with all these things. I'm, I don't know if I'm as well read into the occult stuff, but... um. Well, because it doesn't make sense to me in the, and maybe it'll, let's, let's wrap it up before I, I don't want to start going into my take on it. It doesn't really make sense to me because Enoch, there's the Enochian language and I don't know, maybe the occultists are using that and they shouldn't. I don't, or I don't know. Anyway, let's keep going. Lineage. There's a lineage from the book of Enoch and it runs through Enoch, John D. Joseph Smith from the LDS Mormon creation story, Alistair Crowley, Jack Parsons, right? Uh, Enoch was obviously before the flood, so we're talking thousands and thousands of years ago. John D was uh, 1500s. Remember, we and we're gonna do. In fact, next week I think I'm dropping it. We're having a big John D deep dive. Uh, my man Jordan from Wind and Sea Coffees joined me. We already recorded it. I just gotta. I got to put the finishing touches and edit it and release it. But we went so hard in the paint on John D. It's like two hours. And I'm going to drop that here soon because I think that's relevant as well for what's going on, the topics at hand here. But John D., he learned the Enochian language, right? He was making contact with angels or spirits, and they said, here, write this down. This is the alphabet we use, and you can talk to us anytime, old buddy. And guess what they gave him? Visions of the end times, the apocalypse. He was chasing the eschaton. Emanitizing the eschaton, as they say. Yeah, you go from Enoch to John D to Joseph Smith, who was a hundred, couple hundred years after, you know, 1800s. Alistair Crowley, who was early 1900s doing this stuff. And he channels Lamb, the first gray alien in 1918 using the Amalantra working based upon the Enochian language. If this is all new to you, you got to read my alien books, folks. I don't know what you're doing. Amazon and Audible. Isaac Weisop. Find it. Learn it. Love it. And then Jack Parsons, who, of course, under the tutelage of Crowley, was doing the Babylon workings and arguably opened up the portal to Roswell. Arguably helped influence the uh, discovery of the Enochian text, right? Um, let's see. And, of course, you know, what's up, what also is in common there? Jack Parsons was trying to bring about the end times, the Whore of Babylon. That's why it's called the Babylon Workings. Now, interesting side note, talking about a lot of the LDS Mormon folk, Brandon Fugel, who's a uh, very prominent businessman in Utah, he's on that show. He bought the Skinwalker Ranch, right? A prominent, you know, prominent LDS, uh, you know, card carrier or whatever you say. Well, he bought Skinwalker. Even had Governor Herbert involved. All these, all these guys are LDS, right? And because you know, the LDS have this sort of occult connection conspiracies about the LDS church with the Freemasons and ritual magic and stuff like that. There's different symbols that support that. I I certainly am not an expert on the subject. But apparently the LDS also say that going back to Adam, Adam was ordained by Enoch and this was the beginning of the Melchizedek priesthood, which from what I understand, the LDS, they, they, I don't know if they baptize is the right word, but they sort of ordain the young boys into the Melchizedek or the Aaronic priesthood or something like that. But it's also interesting that there's these connections, right? Because what I'm saying is Brandon Fugel, he got into, he bought Skinwalker Ranch for a reason. You know, the, this idea of making contact with aliens, it goes back to Joseph Smith who made contact with the alien Moroni, the angel Moroni. Disembodied spirits, folks. That's what we're talking about. 
Now let's talk about Dan McClellan. I took a course of his on Satan. And he talks about Enoch in there. Uh, talks about how in the book of Genesis, the sons of God were were uh, procreating, you know. Uh, you know. We already know all this stuff. I don't need to rehash it. But the book of Enoch elaborated on the book of Genesis. That's why it's important. Um, he says that the first book of Enoch, it talks about the proliferation of evil, as we already said. And that the origin of evil gets assigned blamed to these angels who fell from heaven. And one of these angels, the watchers, right, was Shemi, Shemi Hazah, meaning I have seen the name. And that angel has chiefs underneath them. All right. And then another one is called Azazel, and he's one of the fallen angels. And uh, maybe, maybe there's no pronouns there. <laughs> Azazel, one of the fallen angels, and another one of the chiefs of the fallen angels. Like there, there's a hierarchy here, apparently, right? And he he is opposed to Gabriel. We talked about Michael and Gabriel, the the angels. Where you know Azazel's opposing polarity is Gabriel, and Shemi Hazaz's opposing polarity is Michael. And there's a, there's an idea here of hierarchy of good and evil spirits, which of course my mind takes me to Twin Peaks, the White Lodge and the Black Lodge, the struggle between good and evil, light and dark. Let's see. All right, moving on. Um, Enoch as Hermes Trismegistus. Let's talk about this for a second. There's, there's a lot of questions about this, right? So in alchemy, it goes back to the Emerald Tablets, and this came from the Egyptian god Thoth, the god of magic, or... Hermes Trismegistus, depending on who you ask. And, of course, Hermes Trismegistus is where you get the hermetic, um, the idea of hermeticism comes from Hermes. So Hermes and Thoth and even Mercury, they're all sort of conflated together. But also, you can throw in Enoch as well. Some people say that's the same person. All of these were believed to have invented writing, which I found odd because when I read Diana Pasolka's book about uh, called Encounters... Talks about how writing things down was a sort of a forbidden art back in the time of Socrates. Now, let's see here. Okay, I'm going to go to, to uh, Jason Colavito's. He, he wrote, uh, Jason Colavito wrote an article about Enoch. How did Enoch become identified with Hermes? And we're going to get into some things. I'm going to, I'm going to, this is the last topic. Then we're going to wrap it up with a very long wrap up. I'm not going to profess to understand everything this dude's saying. He's a smart guy. I don't agree with him always, but he's a smart guy. Uh, let's see. He says, the book of Sothis is one of the sources that started this idea. And I think he references another writing here. You'd have to go to his webpage. Both had astro astronomical connections. Hermes supposedly recorded 36,525 books or lived that many years, while Enoch lived 365 years. Numbers recalling the number of days in the solar year or the Sothic cycle. In the later Judeo-Christian lore, Enoch and the other descendants of Seth, were, remember that's the path of light, good, were said to have built two pillars inscribed with the prophetic wisdom, quote, in the Syriatic land, referring to Egypt, the land of Sirius. Then, of course, you know why Sirius matters so much, right? We've talked about it many times. I should do a single deep dive show on it. I deep dive into it in my book, The Dark Path, about the star Sirius. And, you know, the short version, it's revered by all the occultists. The Freemasons call it the Blazing Star. It's at every single Freemasonic Lodge. It's called the Hidden Sun. It's the source of Thelemic current to Aleister Crowley. They think that there's aliens that come from there. Uh, let's see here. While the Christian forgery, known as the Book of Sothis, has the Egyptian priest Manetho declare that Hermes erected pillars inscribed with prophetic wisdom in the Syriatic land. Later on, he talks about how the kings of Babylon were actually Nephilim giants. It says, The Paschal Chronicle, written two centuries after Iranius, no, and an, an, Ananias, I don't know, tells us that the first kings of Babylon before the flood were giants. Among the Chaldeans, the first king was Alaros, whom Alagoros succeeded, 
and the other leaders to whom the scriptures seem to refer when it says, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. The Christian forgery passing under the name of the Syllabine oracles assumes that those who came after the were giants as well. Pseudo <laughs> Eupolemus <laughs> confirms that there was a tradition that the post diluvian kings of Babylon were giants who escaped the flood. Therefore, it is not entirely difficult to imagine that the Egyptians were envisioned the same way. But is there proof of this? Indirectly, it seems the answer is yes. And he describes how there were legends of Egyptian kings and pharaohs being the actually Nephilim giants, like the David and Goliath story. Right? So in conclusion, oh, so much. We talked about so many things, but let me wrap it up here. It's a long wrap-up, so stick with me here. There was a lecture by a guy named Brian Godawa, who I'm thinking read Heiser's book because he breaks down the Book of Enoch very similarly. Not a diss. I'm just, and maybe he even cites it. I don't know. But anyways, the lecture that I watched, he shed some light on the idea of why the Book of Enoch wasn't in the Bible. But also how it's a warning from God, which is confusing to me. Why not just leave it in then, right? Well, there's a reason for removal. He says that the book of Enoch was pushed out of the canon from the early church fathers, from people like Augustine of Hippo, who said that the giants w- was supernatural. This is fake news. Which, But I read earlier that St. Augustine said that it was literal, so I don't know. Said that before he was Christian, Augustine had background in Manichaean Gnosticism and believed in the angelic flesh mingling over on the Gnostic side, and if we bought into the supernatural ideas of Enoch that would be a little bit close to the Gnostic line of thinking because you got to remember back in the day when Christ was around they argued for decades about what Christ was and who he was and what he was saying and what his intentions were and what man's role is for this and one competing school of thought was Gnosticism that said this is all a material prison planet and uh, the you know there's a real God out there above this fake God who rules this planet. Now how do they how do they know Christ said that? I I don't know. You'd have to talk to a scholar about that. But that's what they believe. And Irenaeus, I believe his name was, was hired by the the current Christian faith that we know of, like the Roman Catholic Church, Orthodoxy, whatever, right? That kind of thing. But that version of Christianity beat out. Gnostics because of Irenaeus who wrote a bunch of, I don't know, propaganda, you know, dismissing those ideas. Propaganda, whether it's true or false, right? Because I'm not a Gnostic, so I don't know. There's also talk from this lecture about God's punishment because Enoch shows up in genealogy in the Bible, like in Genesis before the flood and... um and says, and Enoch says that he walked with God, but then he was not, meaning he didn't die. He went to heaven and didn't die. In the book of Hebrews, it says that Enoch was taken up so he would not see death. So there was an idea that Enoch was a chosen one from God, and he got the speed ticket up to heaven. And in the book of Jude, it says that Enoch prophesied that God would judge some ungodly blasphemers, which he was right. He knew the flood was coming. Now, let's see here. And then they go through the book of Jude. We don't need to go through that, uh, the whole thing. It's Jude, is it 14 through 15, verses 8 through uh, 15. I'll read 13 through 15, though. Um, Raging waves of sea. He's talking about the flood. Raging waves of sea, foaming up their own shame. Wandering stars, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now, Enoch, the seventh from Adam prophesied about these men also saying behold the lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him now when i go to the orthodox study bible to see what this book of jude is talking about this is what it explains it says that the raging waves are actually perverse teachers restless dark bitter destructive and persistent who are casting up as foam as they hit the breakwater of the church 
The higher they raise themselves, the more disorderly and dissipated they become. They crash and perish. In astronomy, a wandering star is either a planet that never rises or sets in the same place, or a shooting star, an asteroid which shines brilliantly but only briefly and then burns out in darkness. These are likely fallen angels, for in the Book of Enoch and other late Jewish apocalyptic literature, star often means angel. Side note, a wandering star reminds me of the term traveling man. It's a term Freemasons use to talk to each other. But um, it says that God has always judged the wicked who dwell among the righteous. All right. So what, so what I found interesting is that it's warning us about perverse teachers who push destructive and bitterness. And again, going back to what I was saying earlier, I don't want the respond. I don't want to be the one that pushes darkness, bitterness, and destructiveness. We talk about these subjects all the time, and of course, a byproduct of that is for people sometimes to even go black pill and to go that route. And I want to try to do a little more proactively to try to prevent that. And I know that's not, and that was what my conversation on breaking social norms with Josie is. How do I do this? Because I don't let it, I don't let these dark subjects affect me. Like the way it affects some people, some people get really upset and I don't because I can't, I would never be able to continue this journey and I don't know why that is. I don't know. Is it a gift from God, a curse from God? I don't know what it is. Um, I, I do the research and I go about my day and I don't know how to put it into words. Right. And that's what this year is going to be about for me is trying to figure out how to how to do that. Right. So I think it's interesting that that's kind of what it talks about. It talks about it being a bad thing to push black pill. Now, I've got some lingering questions, of course. I don't know if I can answer all of them, but let's let's get going on it. Are, you know, are the Nephilim bloodlines really there? Were they really giants? Were they eleven thousand feet tall? Were they are the bloodlines the Illuminati? I I don't know. Are we? And, and let's talk about the final days, the the eschaton. Are we in the final days? Through the lens of pop culture, let's take a look. Do we have? Um acceptance of these forbidden arts that the watchers were teaching through entertainment yes we do uh, you, you know harry potter is all about occult magic there's many movies about cannibalism uh we talked about them here on this show year two three years ago fresh um bones and all i haven't seen that one yet so i haven't done a show on that kurt barker's book i read that and i gave you all the details on that i think that's only on the patreon uh, a couple years ago, because uh, the book claimed that cannibalism is part of the Illuminati system, the ways of being. Um, vanity, yes, we got vanity. Look at in- look at Instagram. Of course we do. War, <laughs> have we ever not had war? I I mean I don't know. Like that's a, that seems like a tough one. Um, blood spilling, of course, entertainment shows us that. Have you ever seen a John Wick movie? What's the body counts on those movies? We and the influence, mass shootings everywhere. These guys dressing up in this. Special ops gear, like shooting little kids, like, bro, what are we doing? What is going on? We've got, you know, and and wickedness, right? That's the term you see often. It just means being evil or morally wrong. Well, I mean, I hate to say it because I, I, look, I consume all this media. I'm not above it. I'm a hypocrite there, you know? I listen to rap music. A lot of this, like, drill rap music, trap music and stuff. They glorify it. And look, you could defend it and say, no, this is the experience of these people. They're they're speaking about selling drugs and violence because they've witnessed this and they've lived in it. And that's terrible. They, sh- they shouldn't have to do that. But I think, like, speaking from, like, oh, the white suburban non, you know, I've never lived that lifestyle. I, I think part of it is, like, Scarface, right? I love Scarface. That's a great movie. And, like, you're kind of rooting for Scarface in some ways. You're like, yeah, dude, this is great, man. But it's not. It's wicked. <laughs> and that's like the same with the music. It's like, these are these are not good things that we're embracing. And look, like I said, I'm not condemning it. I, I still consume all of these things. And I don't know that that will ever change. But the, the trick is you to not let it influence you. And I don't know if that is that good enough to sleep well at night. 
I'm supporting it. I'm paying money. I'm giving I'm 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 giving my listenership and my interest and my money to uh you know Scarface and rap music and stuff. And that's going to influence young people to make the wrong decisions and join gangs and do this and the other along with a million other things that influence those decisions. So, I don't know. I, it, it really, it really, if you really sit down and think about all these things, it's, 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 uh, it's frustrating. I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure what to, where to take that, right? And then, of course, there's a film that shows us all this stuff. Darren Aronofsky did a film called Noah, and unbelievably, the Watchers, the fault, the forbidden, the the angels that were teaching forbidden arts and magic and cannibalism and all this stuff. They're actually the good guys. They help Noah out. And, um, you know, and in the movie they call God the creator, which isn't really, you know, that's a Freemason term. The grand creator. That's the G in the compass and square. But let's let's try to finish positive, right? Well, let's, okay, wait, one more thing. Okay, the good, we got good news and bad news. Let's start with bad news. I want to leave on a positive note. The bad news, a lot of the ideas of summoning entities using this Enochian language seems to be picking up. I mean, it really does. That's the scary part that makes me think maybe this is the end times. I mean, you see all these shows about ghost hunting and some, you know, Stephen Greer's out there channeling meditating aliens in. People are interested in these subjects. I'm interested too, but I don't ghost hunt anymore. And I, I don't try to summon aliens. The good news It sounds like all the bad attributes of the Nephilim and the Watchers isn't something brand new, okay? This has been going on for hundreds of years. I find it, in a way, unlikely this is the worst of it. I mean, are we living in a perverse society that's got a lot of these things? Yeah. Has it always been that way? Yeah. I mean, I think it seems like it has been. Is it more acceptable today and more out in the public? Kind of, but I think if you bring some of these bad things to light, that's the only way that you can get people to stop it, right? You know, have open, honest conversation. It's like um, they talk about fornification, adultery, right? Adultery is not good. But that's why there's value, and this is this is a hot take, personal take. You know, me and Josie have done tons of therapy together, individually, all that stuff. And in a way, and this isn't an easy path, but To be open and honest about, you know, sexuality and interest and taboos and things you like and don't like. I mean, there's a limit, right? Like, you don't want (laughs) to, you don't want to be like every single thought in your head comes out of your mouth type of thing. But to be open and honest and talk about those things is in a way better than to shame them and sort of put them underground in a way. I don't know. There's different, there's different ideas and schools of thought about it. But um putting putting a light on the things that seems to be happening right we 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 have rap music to use that example talking about guns and violence and selling drugs and stuff well enough people listen to it and they think man is that what's really going on like, some people didn't know that some people don't know that this is actually someone's lifestyle and like how tragic that is man like we should try to make it so like this isn't what they grow up seeing i li- I literally met a guy yesterday who grew up in Compton in the nineties. And I said, wow, like, was it, was it really like that? You know, I, cause I grew up, you know, suburban white guy from PA listening to, uh, Dr. Dre talk about Compton and all this stuff. And he was like, yeah, man. And he's like, it was, you hear, you hear people crawling around on your roof, hiding from cops. Like it was just a normal part of your life. And you know, you just, there were certain rules you tried to follow and whatever. And I think, man, that's terrible. Like, I don't, that's not the country I want to live in that, that people are doing this stuff. You know, and I don't know what the answer is, obviously. But anyways, the point being is that in some ways, airing that out so that people hear it and then they can make a choice of like, oh, is that the world I want to live in? Is that what I want these people that live in this community to go through? And the truth is, no, we don't want that. And then you can start making other choices. So in a way, to have it so sort of out there, maybe that's a good thing. 
And what do, what do we do with all this information? Because, you know, lots of people out there, they want to embrace this inner warrior, which I get. Because they hear all this stuff and they get all raged up. They want to direct it somewhere. Well, I don't know. Go find the Nephilim. Go find a giant alien and <laughs> direct it towards them. You know, you're chasing ghosts. You you can't get outraged. And I get it, right? And this is where it gets into that weird, vague black pill talk. And 2024 is, we're going to try to focus on not going full black pill. I'm going to push a little bit of self and betterment stuff here and there. Nothing, nothing radical. I got some guests. We maybe we'll talk about like health and nutrition a little bit here and there. Some conspiracies about it that'll wake people up to it. But it's more about we got to find peace, right? We got to find peace in our lives because 2024 is going to be so bad. So, but not bad. So, so hectic. We've got another presidential election, and wouldn't you know it, it's the same two guys, the same two 80 year old white dudes who don't know what the hell's going on. You know? We've got the same two guys to pick from. Can you believe it? I mean, of course, it's only January. I don't know that, but I already know that. I already know that. That's what's going to happen. And it's going to be divisive because that's what they do. And, I mean, I just, we got to find a peaceful way through this, folks. And, uh, you know, going black pill means you're susceptible to influence. It's uh, people stoke fear and you, you, you have a tolerance you build up for fear and you, you need more and more to sort of get your dopamine fix or whatever. And these people, they want you to, they want to, they want to wind you up and then set you off in the direction they want you to go. Right. I'll give you a metaphor. And of course this is, I'm not going to, I'm not condemning one political side or the other, even though I, I, <laughs> you, I'm not condemning one side or the other, but let's give you a, an exact example. Certain people were winding up the people who were peacefully protesting, okay, at the Capitol on Jan, the Jan 6, right, the Storm the Capitol Day, right? And you see all these people revving up the crowd, getting them mad, and that anger has to go somewhere. And arguably protesting peacefully is you're out marching and you're, you're screaming or whatever. Like, that's the way you let out the rage, but some people got built up too much rage. They got revved up. And they stormed the Capitol thinking that they were doing the right thing. And what do you know? They're they're sitting in prison cells. And guess who's not sitting in prison cells? The people who wound up those people. Who who told them, yes, this is worth it. You need to go in there and break in and all this stuff, right? And I'm trying to use that as a metaphor. I know that's a very charged metaphor, but, like, that's what we're talking about. Like, there's people who get off. They get power wealth, views, whatever, by winding people up with fear. And both sides do it. I could have picked a liberal example, too, I'm sure. I mean, you know, I'm susceptible to that, too. You start, you know, worrying about all kinds of stuff on that side, too, because everything's fear-based. But it depends on your worldview, right? If you're religious, you know, you're Christian, find peace knowing that, hey, you know what? This doesn't change the way I behave as a Christian, this shouldn't change the way I behave. Whatever's going on in the outside world. They say be a, uh, what was the term they use? I've heard uh, be in the world, but not part of the world kind of thing. Now, that's why there's monks go and live in caves and monasteries. Because they, they they can't handle it. They're not hand, That sounds bad. They, they don't they don't want the influences of the world to hit them. And they're like, no, there's thing, there's things more important to me. And that's my salvation. So that's all I'm going to focus on. I'm not. I don't have a cell phone, social media, nothing. And, you know, if you're a Christian, God, if God's coming to clean house, well, that's even more reason to be on your best behavior, right? And do what God was saying as Christ. Don't use this fear of the apocalypse. Fill your heart with hate for everyone. And, you know, don't start ignoring the commandments. Listen to what Jesus said. Love one another, right? That was the deal. People think they're going to steer the the reality to bring back God or, you know, like you're not going to, look, God's going to do what God's going to do. You, you no role in that whatsoever. You can't change the state of the world to tell God to stay up in heaven or come down and kill us all. Like you're just not going to do it. Even the, uh, even the Buddhists, right? I've been reading some Buddhist stuff lately. They believe the end times is also going to be full of bad things. Um, they think that the Maitreya, I don't agree with this, of course, Matre is going to come back and achieve full Bodhi enlightenment and teach all the Buddhist Dharma teachings, right? The Dharma from uh, Siddhartha Buddha. And 
and if you're Buddhist, you can even look at this and, you know, they teach non-attachment, the uh, the upadana. You're not supposed to let things wrap wrap you around the axles. You're not supposed to cling to people, cling to concepts, cling to ideas to the point of obsession or craving. And Because these things lead to depression. That's the short version, right? You're supposed to go down, you know, go down your eightfold path to enlightenment. And um, and what would Cooper do, right? Let's talk about Twin Peaks. Let's, we could throw Twin Peaks in there. What would Cooper do? Didn't he face this exact same thing? Fallen Angels, Black Lodge versus White Lodge. Yes, he faced the same thing. He faced the same thing. And I don't want to give anything away because if you're in if you're in the Gray Lodge with me on the Patreon, we're only on season two. So there you go. And if you want more on that Matreya, we talked about Matreya in. Uh, the idea of a, as a Luciferian end of the world type spirit from the UN and Alice Bailey and all this stuff. If you want to hear about that or Project Blue Beam or the end days and the alien agenda, pick up my books. I got two books, Aliens, UFOs, and the Occult, Use Your Illusion 1 and Use Your Illusion 2. Amazon, I self-narrated it on Audible. You can buy signed paperbacks at my Gumroad store, gumroad.com slash Isaac W. Links are in the show notes and all that stuff. So there you go. That's the Book of Enoch. That's the Nephilim. It's uh, it's all about the end days. But in the same hand, it's something they've been doing for hundreds of years. So who knows when that's going to be. But be ready either way. <laughs> all right, folks. All right, thanks for listening. Uh, till next time, stay woke.